Good evening. Yesterday I am giving now this video, making this video, the day after Pesach. Yesterday, today was Isru Chag, yesterday was Achron Shal Pesach, and I want to say to you before we talk about Rosh Chodesh Eir and Parshas Achrei Mos, it's only one Seder this week, it's not uh, Achrei Mos Kedoshim like usually or many times it is. And I want to say to you that many ask the question, why is it that we have four Borei Pri HaGofens at the Seder? It's something that we should make one bracha, it's one sitting, and that should be it for the evening. And if you're going to say, as they say, Taka, that each is a separate mitzvah, then after the Bari Priyar Gofen, we should make an Al HaGefen. And we should be able to deal with each mitzvah one by one. So, the idea expressed is that each one tak is a separate mitzvah, and therefore it requires a separate bracha. And why we don't make a al hagefen after the first or after the second, like we do after we drink the fourth, we say al hagefen is because there's a difference between birchas ha-mitzvahs and birchas ha It means when you sit down and you eat something and you enjoy the food, we make a bracha rishoyna, and afterwards we make a bracha achroyna. But on birchas ha like if a person's Masada kedushin, he does the eris and he makes the two brachas at the beginning, and he drinks the wine, he doesn't say a birchas, a bracha chroina. First of all, he's careful to drink a little less anyway, just to be, it's all the opinions. But the idea is that a birchas ha doesn't have a bracha chroina, which is tied to it. When we put on tefillin, there was, they were not masakin any bracha after you make the bracha, the etzim, mitzvah, and since each one over here is not birchas hanenen, it's birchas hamitzvahs, and we make the four hagefens, it's not shayach to say that we should make an al hagefen after the first one, even though if it was birchas hanenen, we would definitely have to, because when we make kiddush, till we come to the second kos, it's usually two hours till you get done listening to all of the Manishtana and to everything else. Why do I mention that to you today after Pesach? Because the Sfarim express that Pesach is meant not only to do the mitzvah halayla, and to do what we do for the Seder and have Yom Tif like we do Shavuos and Sukkot. But it's a step further. It's meant to seep into the bones of every single Yid. Now it's true, on Shavuos and Sukkot we say also, V'asiyenu Hashem Elokecha, as birkas moyadecha, that there's a special brocha that is with each and every Yom Tif, and we hope to leave the Yom Tif with that uplifting, with that inspiration, with the whole koyach of that Yom Tif. But Pesach is the shoyrish of all the Yom and Tov. As I told you in At Pash, that the Aleph corresponds to the Tov, and that's Tisha B'Av, and the spits of Geula and the spits of Golos are tied together because if you do on Pesach what you have to do with Kavana, L'Shem Shamayim, and Besimcha, then you can eradicate the Tisha B'av of the summer. And that is the backbone of 
all the yomim toivim, not just in a drosha, but to be able to remain with us, it should permeate, like v'chol amarba, the Yitzias Mitzrayim Harizem Meshubach. Meshubach is a lotion that the Gemara uses to discuss and describe wine. That when we have wine that is aged, it's called Yayin Meshubach. So much so that the quality changes that if a person makes a Bari Priyagofen for Kiddush and then in Shabbos, and then they bring in, in the middle of the Suda, a superior wine, he makes a bracha hatova metiv. Now, if the wine was sitting there at the very beginning on the table, he doesn't make a hatova metiv, even if it's a superior. But if it's brought in, it wasn't available, so to speak, at the actual setting of the table, when it does come in, we make hatova metiv, because that's yayin meshubach. And that's what a person is supposed to, his quality, as his neshama and his guf are together united to do the rotson of our Kodesh Baruch Hu, that when we come through the Seder and the, all the days of Pesach, The hope is that it'll permeate and become part and parcel so high, so enriched from what Pesach seeping into the bones and drenching the neshama and his whole machshava, dibur, and maisa, that that should remain with us as we are elevated by the Yom Tiv, and then go in to the days of the year. Now, the B'nai Soscher brings that since Pesach begins in the middle of the month, therefore, we only have a certain amount of days, 14 days that we count Sphira in Nisan. But in Eir, we count every day of the month of year, we count Sphira. Now, counting Sphira is making a bracha and saying the day. If we did that in the middle of the summer, it would be meaningless. But it's like magic that when the bracha is said and you say the day of Sphira, what it actually is, you count it, it's like igniting the biggest powerful energy that could be from Shemayim into the person. That's why Sphere is such a exalted mitzvah which we do in the way that we do it. Says the Bnei Sascher that since we have every day of ear, and this Shabbos is Shabbos Mavarachim ear. That Rashi Tfilin, which is Keneged Olam Habriya, and that's what we have the mitzvah with each and every morning when we put Tfilin on, it's with Rashi Tfilin. But Al Pikabola Rabbeinu Tam is bigger than even Rashi. Now, a person can't say, well, I'll do, therefore just put on. Rabbeinu Tam, the mitzvah has to be done, and that's the psak with Rashi Tfilin. But Rabbeinu Tam, because, says the Bnei Sashar, that it is higher, it's the Olam of Atzilus, therefore the entire month of Ir is drenched with the Koyach of Sviras HaOmer. And the month of ear is spelled two ways, as the Bnei Soska brings. Aleph Yud Reish, Ani Hashem Rofecha, that it's a Chodesh of Rafua, Ani Hashem Rofecha, but it's also spelled by many, 
Aleph Yud Yud Reish, Avraham Yitzchak Yaakov Rochel, the Dalad Ragle Hamerkova. So we're in a very, we're sandwiched in with Nisan, which is the month which we are able to rise to a tremendous level, and Nisan no has paid them, and it's this Arusa de la Eila, that the bracha comes showering down Klal Yisrael, but then we go into a Chodesh of Ir, which is Ani Hashem Rofecha, and it represents in every which way the Dalad Ragli HaMerkava, which when Mashiach will come, there'll be the Hiskalus of this Merkava, and what in Ruchnius it is, and what it means to Klal Yisrael. So we should grab onto the opportunity now that we've been elevated and dipped into the mikveh of Nisan and going even higher into the month of Eir and make the most of it. Now, I want to say to you that in our Sedra we have a Pasek Kemase Eretz Mitzrayim Lo Sasun. And the Meforshim are curious, what is the word Eretz doing in this Pasek? It could have just said that HaKadosh Baruch Hu said that like the activities and what you saw, the actual Maisim of Mitzrayim is, you should never go in that direction. But the Mefarshim say that the Eretz is a underscoring the Gashmias of Mitzrayim. Because it says in Medrash that the Mitzrayim were exceedingly well-to-do. The actual Hamon of Mitzrayim, the Nilus used to rise and water and irrigate all the fields, and they had all sorts of produce and, and merchandising because of this, and they were very well-to-do. But look what it did, and Sadiqim used to say that Klal Yisrael always withstood the test of poverty, of Aeneas, that means a yid, if he was sc sc scraping together for the chalas and the wine and for what he needed to pull through the week with himself and his family, he was able to do it. But unfortunately, they say that the Nisoyen of Ashiras, they did not withstand totally. Many did. We all know Gevirim, who are not haughty, and don't become Balei Gea, and Gaiva, and feel, now that they have the money, they're the biggest Chochem, they're the biggest Eitzegeber, they're the biggest, they have the money. And that aura of wealth is a very big test to a person's daily mitzvahs and avoidus Hashem. And that's what the Pasuk is saying. Kemaisa Eretz Mitzrayim. Eretz, the artsius, the gashmius of Mitzrayim, don't learn from them. That means to, what they did as Rishoyim we know that the Pasuk doesn't have to come and tell us, don't be a Russia. But a person could be an Oivir Hashem, and then he inherits $10 million, and two years later you barely recognize the person. Yeah, he's still a Shomer Shabbos, he still davens every day, but it's a different person. We should be able to withstand that tremendous 
test. Now in our sedra, we also have a mitzvah that we can learn from a lot. And that's the mitzvah of Kisui Hadam, that certain animals required when they shechted the animal and the blood came out and it went down to the ground that you had to cover it with dirt. And the Gemara says, Vishachat shachat, that you can't just take dirt and kick it over the blood, but you have to take your hand, the Gemara Darshan is Vishachat, you shecht with your hand, that which you shechted with it, your hand, you use the knife, you have to bend over and with your hand take the earth, the dirt, and put it over the blood. And that's a mitzvah of kisui hadam. And the Gemara says, Shalom yehe mitzvahs bezuyos, because if you take your foot, and yet there's a mitzvah, I say, the Arisa, to cover the thing. So you're going to do the mitzvah with kicking your foot and kicking the dirt. That's a bizoyan for the, for the mitzvah. And the briskerov often used to talk about this kisui hadam because he said that it is a hakara of HaKadosh Baruch Hu that the blood that sustained the life of this animal, and we don't, we run from blood. I mean, you know how before the butchers would salt the meat? How long a, a housewife had to take the meat and soak it and then salt it and to get the blood out? Because lo sochul adam, that we're not allowed to eat blood. There's an isser. But that blood that we are so separated from, and blood, and that's why it was by Pesach, where Volchon and Wasserman said, how could it be that a normal person thought that they were taking the blood of a child and making the matzah? If there's one thing that is a testimony to the world, it is the fact that Jews are, have nothing to do with the blood. We have to kosher our meat and we go through a very major undertaking to get rid of every drop of blood. So Rebbe Khan Vasman said that that blood libel came because they fooled Yaakov Avinu with they took the colored coat the Ksonas Pasim of Yosef, and they dipped it in the blood of a Seir Izim. To fool Yaakov Avinu, they should think that some wild animal tore Yosef apart, and this is his blood on the Ksonas Pasim. And said, Rebbe Chanan, we're still having a kapara for that which the Shifte Kod did with Yaakov Avinu, by the blood libels that they went and murdered so many Yidden that the Yidden paid a price for what their, the Shifte Ka, their forefathers did in terms of their Hanhaga with Yaakov to cover up what was going on with Yaakov Avinu, with the Yosef Atzadik. Now, the entire Parsha, 98% of the Parsha is, and we lay it Yom Kippur by day, in the morning by Shachris, what is the Kriya Satora? Achrei Mos. But if you take a look at Achrei Mos, you'll see that the first Pasuk talks about Achrei Mos, Shnei B'nei Aharon B'kor Vasam, the Karvasam, that they brought a korban when they went into the Kodesh Kedoshim, Lefnei Hashem Vayamusu, and they died. 
And as soon as that first Pasuk is concluded, then the Torah goes into the long litany of what did the Koyen Gadol do be Yom HaKippurim? And it describes the fact that he had different change of clothes five times on Yom Kippur and what type of korbanos and what the katoiris lifnai v'lifnim was and the details of the avoidus Yom HaKippurim by the Koyen Godel. So the Meforshim ask, why this opening Pusik about Nodav and Aviyu? I mean, the whole parsh is talking about the Kohen Gadol and Yom Kippur, so why not just begin with that? Why did the Torah HaKadosh Baruch Hu put in that first Pusik? And the Meforshim explain that the first Pusik is there right next to the Avoid of Yom Kippur to tell you one major thing. That just like Yom HaKippurim is Mechaper and there's Slicha, Mechila, Kapora on Yom Kippur, so Misa Tzadikim, that when you take a Tzadik and he dies, and if he was a tzaddik, why did so many of them die before their time? Like we know, Rav Shimshin Istrapala, Zecher Tzaddik V'Kadosh Levracha, Zechuso Yogen Aleinu Hashem Yinkom Domo, that Yinkom Domo, that he should, his, be his blood should be avenged, nekama should be taken for his blood because Mikubolim said that Rav Shimshon Estrapola lived at the time of the Gezeris Tach Vitat, 1648 and 1649, and tens of thousands of Yidden were mercilessly killed by the Cossacks. And they showed Rav Shimshin that another 500,000 Yidden all over Europe and all over everywhere are going to be murdered and slaughtered. But if he accepts on himself to be tortured and killed, there won't be another Yid killed. And all the Mikubalim were made to this, that he had such a cholim. And he accepted right away. Save Yidin, of course. And they tortured him mercilessly. And he died. That ka- point of Kaporis. Avoinas and Gezeros come with Misa Sadikim. We learn from this first Pasuk being put right next to Avoidas Yom HaKippurim. That just like Yom Kippur's Mechaper, so is Misa Sadikim. Now, it says, Beferish, that Sadikim. when the Malach HaMavas comes to them, does not have to accept them. They could kill the Malach HaMavis. They could reduce them into ashes. And I once ho- heard from the old Skol Rebbe, Zecher Tzadik V'Kodosh Levrocha, who was nifter close to 50 years ago, but he used to come down to Shalashudas and say that that night he had a chalom and his Zayd of the Baal Shem Tev came to him and went over this and this Torah from that week's Parsha, and he would repeat the Torah that he had just learned together with his Zayda that night, Bachalom. So he was very great. And he used to talk about the Mises Sadikim of how 
tzaddikim gave up their lives because they wanted to. And even he said that when the Malach HaMavis comes to tzaddikim, they could wipe the Malach with, with, with the with the floor. But they don't do it because it's not the Ratzon of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That means if HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted not to do it, he wouldn't send the Malach HaMavis. So it's not that the Malach HaMavis overpowers the Tzaddik, but it's the Ratzon of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so they go along with the death process. Otherwise, they would not have to do it. And we found many tzaddikim, like Elisha and throughout the Doris, that were Mechaya Mesim. They were able to be Mechaya Mesim. A nes golui of a child or a person that died, and, and they were able to revive and resuscitate the person that they once again lived. So the concept of what tzaddikim live through, not only in their life, because many tzaddikim, when they would give a bracha for children, they lost years of their own life. They're going against the gezer and shemaim. They were moiser nefesh to help the family have children. Now the bracha is not always such a story. So tzaddikim give brachas, but it's not so posh that the tzaddik is scot-free, as the Svarim say, because if the person 10 years didn't have children, that means Shemayim didn't want them to have. And it's only their bracha that's going to cause them to have, and sometimes there is a kapeda against the tzaddik. So... One of the psukim at the end of describing the avoida of the koyen gadol is that the achas bashana once a year. Now the mafarshim ask, even if you ask a child, uh, how many days in uh, in the year is Yom Kippur? They would answer you, even an eight-year-old child would answer one time, one day a year. So what is the Pasuk telling us as Achas Bashana? What, we need the Torah to tell us two words, Achas Bashana, that Yom Kippur is one day? We understand it. But the Mepharshim say that the Torah was not using extra two words. It was to tell us like when it says by the Kohen Godel, by the Hazoya of the Dam, we say Achas and then Achas Viachas. Achas Ushtayim. Achas Visholosh. Achas Viarba. Why do we keep saying Achas? Just say Achas, Shtayim, Shalosh. I mean, that's how he did it to seven times that he waved and and took the dam and and waved it in the air. But the answer is that human nature is such that after we do something enough, many times it becomes mundane. We have to be machazic ourselves that when somebody puts on tefillin the first day, he, he can hardly sleep the night before, the first time in his life. But after he put on the tefillin the, the hundredth time, is he still shaking? Is he still so uh, imbued and, 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 and reacting to the rarity of something he never did in his life? So we bring down the hislavas, the level of a zest and zeal for the person to go completely above and beyond, that begins to fade. So the koyeng godl, we wanted from him the same fervor. 
on the seventh Hazoya. So we kept reminding him, Achas, like the first time you did it, that's what we want from you. I used to say it at the opening faculty meeting in school every year, for 50 years I would said it, at the opening faculty meeting that when you come in and you take a look at the Zisa Tyra delicious Geschmacka Kinder that you have been entrusted with for 10 months to mold and to shape and to bring out the best of their neshamas in everything you teach and what you say and how you react to everything, that should be with that same fervor the last day of school in June. Not, oh, okay, the year is over, I can't wait to go relax, and I can't, uh, but you should come, out, come in excited to the last day because it's Minashamayim that you were given these neshamas. Why didn't they end up in a different school or in a different class or a different teacher? But min ha'shamayim, hashkocha was, that they were led into your classroom. And believe me, the comments and the sipure tzaddikim and different things that a teacher does in addition to whatever she is teaching children, she has a lifelong indelible imprint on each and every child of how she treated them and how she loved them and if she was sour and she let her personal life come into play in a classroom that if she had a difficult day at home she wasn't allowed to come in to the classroom and carry over her bad mood because somebody was honking while she was driving to teach to school for 20 minutes and she was ready to plot. And with that anger and that terrible attitude, bring it into the classroom and the children for the next three or four hours have to suffer and have to have that carried over into the spirit of the classroom. So we have to seize opportunities and we should be able to say to ourselves that before I walked in to teach the 48th day, I stopped for that minute that I take every day to reset my dial I am coming in to do HaKadosh Baruch Hu's work. I am the shaliach, and I am able to make the difference in these children's and the, each and every child's life. And that sets the mood and the tone and the frame of mind of the teacher. Now, when the Kohen Gadol came out of the Kodesh Kedoshim, he changed his clothes. And Rashi says on the Pasuk, the words, Vihinichem Sham, and he used to bury the clothes right there. And Rashi says, Sheteunim Geniza, that they had to be buried. In other words, these clothes were never to be used again. Next Yom Kippur or a different Avoida. They had to be buried and left there. Now, we know that when the day was over and the red, the chut hashani, the red thread became white, and that was a signal that Shemayim was nodding in unison that the kapara came to Klal Yisrael. This koyen godl was a human being. I mean, we know that there were many Kohanim Gedolim that didn't live through the moment that they were in the Kodesh Kedoshim, the time they were there, because they had one Machshava Zara, they died on the spot. And that's why the rope around their foot pulled them out. No one could go into the Kodesh Kedoshim to take them out. So they came out and they came back to the people 
And there could have been a level of accomplishment, patting themselves on the back. And v'hinichem sham, the Pusik says, they left over right there. All of the feeling of glory and, oh, look what I did for Klal Yisrael. The last coin girl died on the spot. I didn't. I carried out the mission. It had every right to have some pride and some happiness. V'hinichem sham, he left it there. And to us, it reminds us of the people who their whole life, they lived to 90, but the whole life, they never grew. Because they were busy saying, I'm a Shomer Shabbos, I keep kosher, uh, I go to shul to daven. And look at the people down in Texas, half those Jews don't even know what it means to fast on Yom Kippur. In other words, he's busy patting himself on the back that at least I'm this, at least I'm that, look how good, look how... V'hini sham. We have to do a maisa chesed or learn a geshmaka blat gemara and do it with the fervor making HaKadosh Baruch Hu happy. But when we close that gemara to go home to eat, or to start davening mincha, or whatever we're doing, v'hinicham sham. You accomplish, be happy, Baruch Hashem, but don't carry it through. Every day of your life, patting yourself on the back how good you are. Only look forward with what has to be accomplished yet. In the day, in the week, in the month, Yom Kippur was once a year, but there's Yom Kippur caught in every era of Rosh Chodesh. Now, when I say every era of Rosh Chodesh, let's say in the middle of Hanukkah is Chodesh Teves. So we don't have a Yom Kippur cotton the day before Rosh Chodesh because you can't fast and lane Vayachal on Hanukkah. But what we do in cases where it comes out Shabbos Rosh Chodesh, or other Rosh Chodoshim that the day before we can't fast, so we pull it back a day or two to Thursday to, so that we should be able to do certain things at least of Yom Kippur cotton, but it was a monthly cheshbon. That means when we stand there Yom Kippur and we, we stand there Yom Kippur and we're asking we're thinking back how good or how bad we were. And we want to do the tshuva shalema, the tshuva ilah, to be able to really contribute to that clean slate that we end up getting and deserve it because we did tshuva. And then the slicha mechila kapara come. But it's not limited to just Yom Kippur. It's heir of Rosh Chodesh. And as it says in Svarim, Chovis Alavavos and others, that Erev Shabbos, a person should do tshuva looking back on the week. Not just the month and not just the year, but on the week. And then it says a step further that before you go to bed, you take five or ten minutes and think through the day. <coughs> How much good you did. You brought Hashem daven three times with a minion. You brought Hashem had good kavana by every bracha before you ate, and you had you have a long life. But was there a shortcoming? Did you waste an hour talking to somebody about nonsense? An hour of life. How many people we have a halacha that for chaye shah to save someone's life even if he's almost dead. But we can get him another hour, Machal Shabbos, we do everything and anything to help keep that person alive. Chaye <coughs> Shah, the value of an hour of life. <coughs> and what do, unfortunately, some people, they're busy uh, sitting around, they're reading the New York Times, they're, they're, why is that worthy 
of time of life. For every single mitzvah, for every chesed, you go into a house that a lady can't eat, she's not well enough, or she needs encouragement to eat. Some of them are so despondent they don't want to eat. And you come in and you pick up her, her, her spirits with a smile and you talk to her about how her day was and how she feels and, and truly you show the interest to know and then you help her eat. You either bring her the food, you set it up. And, uh, that's koina oilam haba. Why busy, be busy with the shtusim and give time of life? And the people who are busy patting themselves on the back, I mean, listen, I ran around for five hours to help this and that. I mean, what, I'm not entitled to, to sit in front of a television or watch videos or the, I mean, I'm a lot of relax. I mean, there's nothing wrong with relaxing. A person could take a piece of cake and take a coffee and sit for 10 minutes or 15 minutes and catch his breath. Of course, no one's saying no. But when a person scrutinizes his own, not the next guy that you're always ready with good criticism for, but for yourself, to be honest, a moment of truth, a lot can be accomplished. Vihinicham sham. Now, I want to tell you that the second day of Rosh Chodesh Ir is the yard site of Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk. He was a Talmud Muvik of the Mizritcha Magid, and he was Nifter in 1788. He moved in 1777 to Eretz Yisrael with his friend, Rabbi Avram Kalisker, and they were both tremendously big. You see that the Balatanya heard that Rabbi Mendel of Vitebsker was traveling to go to move to Eretz Yisrael. He packed up his bags and ran after him and caught up to him in the city of Kamenitz. And Reb Mendler told him, you go back, turn around and go back because the people in Russia need you there. And he didn't say one word because he considered them his Rebbe. As a matter of fact, in South Carolina, there's a man that bought at auction a sniff box, Schmeck Tabak, that the Balatanya gave as a gift to his Rebbe, and he wrote on it, it's engraved in the silver box, Lerabi Umoiri Harav Menachem Mendel Mivitebsk, May Ace Talmido Schneer Zalman Ben Rivka. So you see the relationship, because after the Mizritcha Magid was Nifter, and it was the Balatanya who was standing there when he died, and he told him, I, maybe this one should take over after me, or maybe that one. At the end, he said, Reb Vitebsk, and he was considered by many the leader, although others began their own groups of Hasidim. The Balatanya began Chabad. Uh, the Noem Eli Melech, the Rebbe Ramaylech, began his group. Um, many of them had their own division and program for how they could take a group of Yidin and uplift their ruchnius, their spirituality. So this Reb Mendel of Vitebsker came to Eretz Yisrael, he moved to Tzvaz, and he lived there only six months because he said that the, whole, the air in Tzvaz was so holy that every single night he slept an hour, but the basko that was shouting from heaven, from Shemayim, the heavenly voice kept shouting, Shuvu Banim Shovavim, so he couldn't sleep even the one hour a night.
that he wanted to sleep. So for, ten, for half a year he lived there, and then for ten and a half years he moved down to Tveria, which is like a half an hour car ride from Tzvas to Tveria. Now, the, um, while he was there, Rav Zevin brings in his Sipuri Hasidim that a group from Yerushalayim came running to Tveria. Now, Tveria, in those times that they had to come by wagon, could have taken a day or two to get there. Even by car today, it's a two-hour ride minimum. And before they did Kvishesh, it was like three, three and a half hour ride. So it's not close, but they came running up and they came through a Mendlevitebsker. And they said to him that in, er, in Yerushalayim they blew Shoifer because they said Mashiach has arrived. And Reb Mendla opened up the window of his one room apartment where he lived under his shul, which is still standing in Tveria. And there's a Karlina Koil learning in his shul. But in the room that he lived, Reb Mendla, they never went in there. That is under the shul, and you could see it through a little peak in one of the windows, like what the room looked like. Um, and he opened the window and stuck his head out, and he gave a whiff, and he said, no, it is not in the air. So the Lubavitcher Rebetzin, Aleha Shalom, asked the question, why did Reb Mendele have to open the window and stick his head out? Why didn't he just take a whiff in his own apartment? So she answered and said, her, she answered her own question, and she said, because it's, it's a sign that Reb Mendele in his own apartment had the reyach, had the air of Mashiach but he had to stick his head out of the window and see what was doing in the world. And that's why he stuck his head out. So his yard site is on the second day of Rosh Chodesh, which we are going to be celebrating this upcoming week. It's the Shabbos, the Shabbos Mavarachim. And a few, and there's always two days Rosh Chodesh here. It's not the first day. It's the second day Rosh Chodesh, which is his yard site, Zechuso Yogain Aleinu. Now, the Pasuk says, Ushmartem es Mishmarti. Put a, a guard around what I have given you to guard. And we know we have many examples. If there's a mitzvah, let's say in Shmira Shabbos, the Chachamim came, let's say, made muksa, so that you shouldn't, you can't touch a, a pen or pencil because ksiva is a diorisa. If someone takes a pen or a pencil and starts writing on Shabbos, chasashon, lo aleinu, lo aleichem, it's a chi of Misa, that's an av malacha, you're not allowed to do it. So therefore the Chachamim made muksa on many things. You can't touch the pen or the pencil because it's muksa. And that's like a guard to the guard. The halacha is the guard. In other words, there are things that we have to watch and do and not do. Those are mitzvahs. And then around that, another fence is put that we should never come to be over something along those lines. Like we have a halacha that we are not allowed to drink wine sitting at a table with a non-Jew. Not because we ever did anything bad to any non-Jew. And we're not condescending, but we don't want to intermarry either. And many times, when you become too friendly 
and drinking. It doesn't say you can't drink water or you can't drink orange juice. But wine is a, it promotes high spirits. Person drinks and he gets, he's not drunk, but he gets a little, it's not the same person. So that, that could intoxicate you and it could lead one thing to another. And that's why so many tzaddikim were always against young, pretty girls who are leaving. And if they're not pretty, I'm not setting a standard. You know, we don't talk about that uh, publicly. But the idea being to go work in an office because there were hundreds of stories of young girls who came in as a secretary to do a job, to make a few dollars, and somebody in the office just gave her a compliment how beautiful the dress is. And after six months, there was already trouble because one thing led to the other. And we have a whole bushel basket of things that we are told we can't do because we should not come near the limit of the actual thing that we can't do. So it shows you the human frailty, how weak a person could be that the outside influences could tear away every layer of Yerushamayim that a person has throughout his life that he learns Musr, and he does mitzvahs, and we keep talking about Yiras Hashem, because Yiras Hashem is really the bottom line. Because you can be davening a whole lifetime, and you can be learning a whole lifetime, and one day you're put into the test. And if you have not mustered up enough Yiras Shamayim, you are in trouble in that moment of test. So Achrei Mos comes, sometimes it's before Pesach, and sometimes it's after Pesach, the actual Parsha of Achrei Mos. Sometimes it's read with Kedosh, uh, that the Parsha of Kedoshim, it's Achrei Mos Kedoshim. But for us, it's enveloped around Pesach, either right before or right after. And that's because that Kedushas Aaron HaKoyen of Kahuna and Mises Tzadikim of Nodav and Aviu set the pace of an awareness of how careful and how cautious we have to be with when we open up our mouths. What do we say? When we go in, we see delicious donuts and this and that. Are you 100% sure that it's a... Well, yeah, I think I heard from my friend that it, uh, what goes in in the mouth went out of the mouth. There has to be the heroes of the gifts that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave to us in effectively effectuating each and every day of our lives. Bracha v'hatzlacha.